Okay, we're on the air, guys, and um, just wanted to introduce everybody to uh, Joe Gilboy, um, kind of the founder of PA Board Review, and we've recently, a lot of, as a lot of you know who have signed up, um, uh, set up a website with uh, kind of a lecture format that you can get into and review all the stuff that Joe's been teaching over the last, you know, a couple hundred years, I guess, right, Joe? 22. 22 years. That's that's a long time. That's great. So we're going to bring all that knowledge to the website and uh, we're going to provide a lot of other things that you can really dive into and get your brain in the right mode for taking the boards. And um, again, we just want to introduce Joe. And Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what got you to this point? Well, okay, guys. Well, hi. This is Joe here. So basically... Um, Wow, what do you want to know? So I graduated from Duke University in 1984, July 29th. I did the ER residue program at LA County USC in 85. Started teaching at USC part-time in uh, 89, 92. Uh, me and a guy by the name of Les Howard, who used to be the program director at San Joaquin and Visalia, he and I kind of started this uh, board review program back then. And then one thing led to another that led to another. and. Well, fast forward to 22 years, and so now I'm at Stanford, I'm at Davis, I'm at Loma Linda, I'm at USC, I'm at Toro and Henderson, I'm in AT Stills in Mesa, Arizona. Um, I went out to Lincoln Memorial University out there in Hargrove, Tennessee, and I also helped with the American Academy of Family Practice PAs with their board review program in Orlando. Uh, God, I can't remember what month that is. I think it's March or April. I'm not 100% sure. Um, so that's about it. So and I work. And what, I work in the ER full time, and that's it. And I do this. What um what got you into doing this? What was your primary motivation for figuring out how to teach people, and what what oh, I, are I, kind I of think, I think that side? I, I'm going to have to declare. I think this is a little DNA. My mother was a kindergarten teacher uh, for 30 years, so my mother. I think there's a little DNA in there with the teaching thing. So I'm going to I'm going to have to uh, say it's probably my mom. To be honest with you, because my mom would break things down to dirt, because she's a kindergarten teacher. So I think that teaching to break things down to dirt, I got from my mom for sure. And that's kind of where you've got this mentality of kind of basic, real, hardcore kind of, you know, just the standards of of getting people to understand the basics of what's right. really going on in the tests, right? I agree. I totally agree. Yes. Very so, very much so. Cool. Okay, well, um, thanks again for everybody who's uh, online with us right now. We're just going to go and start off with a couple of questions. So, uh, it looks like Val, Val was the first one to um, throw out a, a question out there. It's like, how many how many EKGs are on the board test? Is that something you can? Yeah. Yeah. So most of the, I mean, I don't know specifically, but you know, the feedback I get. Most of the EKGs are straight, uh, you know, they're, us they're usually straightforward, so it's not like we're going to go something crazy um, and stuff like that. I think the bigger thing is, is that what other rhythm strips or EKGs, and you'll see this in a lot of the review books, like in the PAEZ, Kaplan, uh, QBank, Exam Master, stuff like that, most of the stuff is very straightforward, and it's more recognizing, I mean, so there's like two questions. The first question, can you recognize what the rhythm strip is, and second, do you know what to do? So like. Maybe they give you a rhythm strip of VTAC and they say, okay, it's unstable. Uh, do you know what to do? Um, you know, which would be defibrillating versus if it was stable and then it's, you know, the treatment of choice is amiodarone. I, I've yet to, you know, really, you know, dive into like if they get really crazy, like, you know, with bifascicular blocks and things like that. I think most of the stuff that you're going to get exposed to, especially in a lot of the exam masters and stuff like that, it's just straightforward stuff. So they're not going to go into this, you know, what's the axis and what's this and what's that. I can't see them going there because that is just getting too minutia. Um, I think most PAs, you know, when you take the boards, I mean, the cardiology is the big section, but I think the bigger thing is just knowing the, the basics to the bigger stuff, not the real minutia stuff, which I think can bog people down when they're studying because now you, you know, you're going to spend your whole day reading on bifascicular blocks when you really should spend your whole day on how do I treat VTAC and stuff like that. So I hope that answers your question there. So when you're when you're thinking about how to attack these things with people and kind of get them in the right mindset, where are you getting your ideas and and um, yeah, what this I, information? Yeah, what I what I've learned is like I mean, no one knows 
what the questions are. So to sit there and even begin to, you know, to say I know what the exact question is, that's just disingenuous and not true at all. But what I do know is this, is that when you teach, you teach students the concept, oh, like for example, AFib, it's going to be there. The question is, is do you know the concept of AFib? Not, okay, this specific question will be there. In other words, if you know the concept of AFib, then you're going to do fine. And then whatever they throw at you, you're going to do just great. I say it's a lot like driving home. If you know how to get to your home, and you know where your home is, and you got the concept of where you live, then if a, if a street gets blocked off, you got to take a different way, you can find your way home. So, for example, um, like with AFib, of course it's going to be there. The question is whether they're going to come at you for what's the treatment modality, who gets it, what does it work on EKG, what are the complications to it. So, in other words, the the problem I see with most students is they want to know what specifically is going to be on there. And this is where students make their biggest mistakes. Don't know, you know the specific answer to AFib. I need to understand the concept of AFib. And, that, and so that's where I think most, that's where I come from. I come from, let's learn the concept of this. So no matter what they throw at us, we'll be able to hit it. And that's how I teach. Well, and you've you've been out looking at at other options and things, you know, training courses and stuff. What what do you think um, your difference is? Is that is that primary the main? Oh, it's the main it, it, it's bar none. I think I'm entertaining the concepts. I keep you on your feet in concepts because you know all the feedback I get, like from the emails, and I mean I just got two emails this morning from some of my students from San Joaquin, and I think the the overall. The most common email I get is really two, to be honest with you. The first the most common email I get is, thank you, Joe, for teaching me more than one answer. Like, for example, and I keep picking on AFib, but I'll pick on it. You know, so like AFib, rapid ventricular response, what's first-line treatment? And the answer, if it, you know, if they're after 48 hours, it's going to be the calcium channel blockers, and second-line therapy is going to be the beta blockers. Third-line therapy is going to be the procainamide. So it's like, so when the students see the AFib question, they got more than one answer. They can plug it in. They're like, okay, I think it's this. I think it's that. And so this is where I think students, you know, flourish. This is what they do best with. And so for me, a lot of the review class courses, they just sit up there and they talk off a teleprompter or something like that. And it's just, <laughs> if you want to get, to, if you want to get some good sleep, go. I mean, you know, most people fall asleep in those things. But I've learned you got to engage students. You got to get them to think. You know, like, okay, so what do you want to do with this guy with AFib? You know, it's less than 48 hours. Okay, we can we can cardiovert. That's great. It's greater than 40 hours. Well, which drug do you want to use? Well, I, you want to use this one. You want to use that one. So, I kind of come from it from a much broader point of view. If that makes any sense. Plus, I try to entertain you, throw a couple jokes out there. Out there. So there you go. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, Wes, you got something to put into that, or you? Yeah, I I think coming from my point of view, I'm a physician assistant at work. Uh, full-time in allergy and asthma and the reason I came to Joe you know I bought some courses bought some questions the the, the connection I have with Joe is uh, he was you know he was he prepared us for the what you know the pants for our, uh, in 2008 um, 2009 and uh, things stuck I mean things stuck with me and as I was going to prepare for this other you know for the the recertification the pan ray you know, I just felt like I was just going through this rotely, you know, in a very, you know, this, you know, and everything became kind of mashed together. I didn't get the concept. I was just getting, you know, signs and symptoms and diagnosis, and it just all starts to, you know, kind of just get very blurry. But Joe teaches the concept like his hepatitis, uh, you know, video, you know, you it's very complex. I mean, I'm an allergy, so I do a lot with antibody, um, antigen, you know, complexes and, you know, but the way he taught it was a very simple, easy to remember, subway, you know, uh, core, um, and you, you get it. You, you get how to get home from a different direction if they, they attack you from a different um, direction. You get, you get the concept. And, it, and like you said, it keeps you engaged. It keeps you guessing. keeps you thinking. And what we wanted to do is take that and, you know, how could I have access to that? Um, how could I get more of Joe in more than one place? And that that was a whole. Yeah, that's actually one of the questions we have here from one of the attendees. It says, what what does your course offer that other courses out there don't? 
And oh, I think that that's pretty a much question. sums it up. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, if I had to like say how am I different, oh gosh, I mean, God, just spend 15, 20 minutes with me and hell, call me on my cell phone. I'll, 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 I'll talk to you. What do you want to talk about? And, and I think you'll see that I will engage you to start thinking. And, and once I get you thinking, I kind of get you thinking down the right path. And then I get you looking more broader, like, okay, so what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Well, and I, I, I got to tell you, Joe, you know, I've, I've attended two of your, your lectures, and I'm a dyslexic uh, graphic designer, <laughs> uh, right brain person, and I'm already picking this stuff up, so you know. <laughs> yeah, no, so I think that's what it is. Um, it's a lot different. I can't, most of the review classes you go to, it's PowerPoint, handouts, multiple different lectures, now, it's not the same one. There are multiple different ones. Some are good. Some are bad. Um, and in the end, no one's really teaching concepts. It's just, here's the signs and symptoms of this. Here's the treatment. Here's the signs and symptoms of this. Here's the treatment. Here's the signs and symptoms of this. And here's the treatment. And no one's, like, opening your mind. Uh, oh, I don't know. Like, uh, well, what the hell? Let me just pick one out. Uh, like, uveitis and iritis, right? So, so they'll talk about, yeah, uveitis, iritis, blah, blah. And, and, you know, what I do is, like, a look. If you got an inflamed uvea or inflamed iris, I mean, who did it? I mean, the answer was you. I mean, your body ate you. So what you really got is an autoimmune disease till proven otherwise. So next time you see the word uveitis iritis, I need to start hunting for something autoimmune. Something's in the water, so let's go look. And so I get people to kind of look broadly from a concept point of view, and then once they get that, they're good. You know, so next time you see someone with uveitis iritis, it's always autoimmune. It's going to be either you know lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, you know sarcoidosis, or whatever it may be. I mean, we've got to hunt a little bit farther to get that answer. But that kind of gets you guys to look broad from a concept point of view, and then we start marching to the more specifics. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've heard you use that word a lot, which is hunting, right? You're teaching right. you're teaching everyone to hunt for the cause right. of these things. Yeah, right. Right, I totally agree. That's what I do. I teach people how to hunt. That's what I do. I mean, that's I hate to say this, but ER people, that's who we are. We're the best hunters you'll ever meet. That's what we do. We hunt. Yeah. We hunt. Um, we've, we've got a question here that I think is pretty good and I'd like to get to. Um, it says, what should I do if I fail the pants? And I know I know that we've had uh, a lot of people that have, you know, just since we started doing this, a lot of the emails coming in are like, dude, I screwed up, I missed, I failed, what do I do now? Right. Okay, so the best thing to do, um, I mean, you know, they're always welcome to email it to me. I'd be happy to analyze it for them and, and tell them what to do. Um, the, if they fail the pants, a uh, couple things you've got to do. The first one is you have to, the devil's in the details. And the issue is, believe it or not, when they get the pants results, there is the, there's the system, and then below it is the task. What people don't understand, it's what it's on the bottom of the page that counts. You see, the bottom of the cage, the bottom of the page where it says task, where it says formulated most likely diagnosis, um, clinical concepts, pharmaceutical interventions. You see, guys, that's the horse. The cart is the subject. For example, maybe you know AFib backwards and forwards, but if you don't know how to how to pharmacologically treat acute AFib. Do you see how you lose now from the from the task point of view? So you're going to lose twice. You're going to lose from the task. That task is pharmaceutical intervention, and then that's going to be dinged against you on the cardiovascular. So this is where people make the mistake. They they kind of misread their results, and so they go, "Oh my gosh, you know, I, I scored a, you know, I scored 100% on infectious disease. Why didn't I pass?" Well, infectious disease guys is only six percent of the exam. I think what is it, nine questions that comes out to be, or something like that. And cardiovascular, pulmonary, and GI and GU are the big ones. So you have to analyze where you went wrong, and then you have to go back at it again. So in other words, let's say you did poor in pulmonary, right? Let's say you got 40%. So what I would do is I'd stop and go right back at pulmonary and hit it hard. At the same time, you know, keep using the cafeteria line, uh, you know, in other words, picking from other subjects and stuff like that. So if there's anybody out there that's listening to me that you, you failed your pants, you're more than welcome to email me your scores, I'll take a look at them, you know, give me your phone number, I'm old school, I'll call you on the phone and tell you, you know, where you went wrong and what you can do to uh, fix it up. Yeah, and I think um, to stress that a little bit too is, you know, 
combination of the last question that we had. It's the, the book that you put out has this step by step and really dives into these things in an in an unorganized fashion. So get your brain organized, right? Right, so, right. Um, yeah, see this this is the problem. If I had to say like what's my pet peeve with the other programs, oh, that's it. I mean, you go up one day and you've got three hours of cardiology. I mean, who in the world can survive three hours of cardiology? You've got to be on <laughs> the to hang with that. I mean, math and coke and I don't know what I'd have to be on to hang for three hours of cardiology. I'd have to be on something good. Um, because the thing is, on the day of the exam, you don't get three hours of cardiology. It doesn't come in a cardiology section. It doesn't come in a pulmonary section. It doesn't come in a GI section. It is absolute stew. It's everything slopped into one. So you may have a question on cardiology, and the next question is going to be on dermatology, and the next question is on a pediatric thing, and then the next question an asthma thing. So I think a lot of times getting people, not that you'd be dis that discombobulated with your presentation, but just spend some time in cardiology and get out. Yeah, we, we just had a there. guy just post a question or, or basically a statement. He says, yeah, is that why our – our lectures are so um, mixed up on the on the website, and yeah, that's right. exactly it. We have, yeah, them, exactly we have them shuffled. It. No, you got to shuffle it. At the end of the lecture, when it's all said and done, we cover everything, guys. Everything is covered. The question is, is how you present it. That's what this is all about, guys. The presentation and learning concepts and how to hunt. That's what it's all about. Oh, I can sit up there and talk three hours of cardiology if you want it. Sure. But I promise you, after about 30 minutes, you're going to be asleep. You will be asleep. You will be taking a nice little nap. Okay, great. Um, big question here says, what questions would you study in order to prepare for the for the pants? I guess that's part of what we were just talking about. Right. No, I think the uh, the the two websites that I like the best for questions um, is going to be PA Easy and Kaplan. I like PA Easy because in PA Easy, uh, what they do is like, and I highly recommend to any student listening to me, do it in the tutor mode. So don't go 300 questions without knowing. Go through the tutor mode. And so let's say uh, the question's on which of the following is the most important to order and some with AFib. And so, so let's say you're, you're there, and, and let's say you get the question wrong. Let's say you know the answer, you know they put. Troponin, TSH, pregnancy test, and you chose pregnancy test, right, which is not right. So you, what they do is they give you the hyperlink right to Lang saying, okay, this is basically why the answer is TSH. And so that's what I like about the, uh, uh, the PA Easy. Kaplan on the other site, on the other thing, the Kaplan test, I like a lot. But Kaplan, if you take the Kaplan test, guys, listen to me, check your ego in at the door. For 55, 60%, that's good. Because some of those questions on Kaplan, wow. I mean, wait to see some of these questions. It's like how many grains of sand are at Long Beach during high tide <laughs> during the summer equinox and how many you know sea turtles are mating right now. It's like, I have freaking no idea. Maybe 30,000, right? So some of the questions are a little far-fetched. Um, but I think in the end, they're both good because Kaplan's harder. PA Easy is harder, is hard too, but it's got great hyperlinks, and that's why I like PA Easy a lot. I really do. I think it's a, I think it's well worth the money. Well worth the money. Yeah, and by the way, all of those are on our website right here. You can um, get in there and just you know direct links to them. So we're not we're not you know we're just out there just kind of help you out with this stuff. Um, tell I wanted us to say, Marcus. Yeah, go for Marcus. It. I wanted to say um, Joe and I had this conversation today about our. Uh, uh, test questions. He has a lot more test questions. Was asking me how we kind of got them into uh, a form where students can take them, and then we went through um, how we can analyze and look at um, the different percentages of people answering certain questions and certain topics. Will give us a good idea. Are we? You know, well, and we're we collecting all that data too, right? Uh, every time yeah. someone takes a test, which I would encourage all of you who are on here right now, go. Um, if you've already signed up for for the website, you know, lectures and, and stuff, get in there and take all the tests. We also have a sample question that you guys can get on and take, um, you know, and get in there. There's and a it. lot more to come also. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So uh, this is this is a list of all the tests we have on there already. So you guys were talking earlier and you're going to we're going to have more than that, right? Oh, yes. Very okay. much so. Great. 
Right. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, oh, I got you know, this is this is the beauty of where we're at right now, right? It's just going to grow and get better. And, um, you know, the more input we have from everybody on the web and things that, that are going on, we can, we can really tailor and change these up so that it's working in your advantage to learn this stuff. So, yeah, great. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's see. Um, do you think that buying the NCCAPA practice questions would be beneficial? No, no, and no, 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 no. <laughs> Whenever you had that question, the answer is no. Save your money, go buy a bottle of wine. That's okay. These are retired questions. They don't give you the answers. They just tell you what percentage you got right, and you're done. So please don't do. I mean, if you got 35, 40 bucks to spend, knock yourself out. Personally, I'd go buy a bottle of wine or. Me, I'd go buy a couple of cases of Coors Light. Okay, that's what I would do. Joe's so don't do it, guys. It's, <laughs> yeah, Joe's Bar and Grill. It's open 24 hours a day, guys. You guys are welcome to come by. But uh, yeah. no, it's not worth it. Long story short, guys, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I took it, I, and it's just like, to me, I, it's the NCCPA's way of making money off your fear. You're going to buy it because you're like, oh, that's the NCCPA. It's got to be good. And all they're selling you is old, retired questions that they don't use anymore. So... Don't do it, guys. It's it's a waste of time. Every student I know that buys it regrets it. I've yet to meet any student who's bought it that says, "Oh, what a great place to get." You know, it's It was not good, not good. So save your money, guys, please. Okay, that's good. Good to know. Um, all right. Well, um, that's pretty much it for the questions. All right. So we have one more. It says, um, "Are the new guidelines for use on statins on the test?" No. Okay. So you're held accountable. Uh, one of the things, and I, I got the, I kind of dug at this when I finally got the right answer. So you're held accountable for what is accountable when you walk into school. So let's say we graduate in 2014, right? So we're held accountable for what was the standard of care at 2012. At 2012, you follow me? So we we started school in 2012. We're graduating in 2014. So whatever Lang had in 2012, that's what you're going to be held accountable for. Because guys. Medicine, if you don't like it, wait five minutes. I mean, have you seen the new standards with the JNC-8 for hypertension? That just changed. You know, that's changed everything. So I think what they do is they try to stick away from some of the newer guidelines knowing, but they go at you more from a concept point of view going, okay, do you know when you want to start a statin on this guy? Do you know that he could probably run into rhabdo? Do you know that, you know, this problem may run, it, run, it, run amok? That's what I'm saying. So the new guidelines, you're right. They have changed, no doubt about it. They have changed, especially with like with the individuals with the metabolic syndrome. Now, you know, they got a, you know, but they get a, you know, LDL level greater than 70. We have to go after them, you know. So it, it has changed, but you'll be held accountable for what you got going into school. So whenever school started, that's what you're being held accountable for. That's all. Well, I also think that's part of the beauty of the online course, right? You're constantly, I know you've sent me pages to update and do stuff on yeah. and the new book and, um, oh, right? We're, we're constantly getting new things that go into there. I guess yeah. I, I'm going to go back to the question we had originally, which was how do you know that stuff's changed and are you, are we ready to, you know, get, um, are we, are we, how do you get that information into the book, and how do you know that it's time to start teaching that stuff? Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't. I misunderstood the question. Say that again. I, so I did. Back to the original question of like, you know, how do we know when this material is up to date, and when should we start teaching it, and when should we start uh, getting these guys, you know, really in, into learning, uh, to, you know, start taking the test with these questions on it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, you know, to be honest with you guys, my book, oh, wow. I mean, if you really want to know the history to it, I'll, I'll give it to you in 30 seconds. When I first doing the book, I had to redo it like mm, maybe every four to five years. And then it became every year. I changed my book probably every two to three months. So I try to keep it as up to date as possible because everything keeps changing. What I do is I try to... You know, like the JNC guide, the JNC eight guidelines, right? So this is something new, and so I put it in the book, saying, going, "Okay, guys, so here's the concept of you know why we use beta blockers and why we use calcium channel blockers and this and that. Here's the guidelines, and I try to I try to give people the idea of the concept. Why is the JNC eight going so hard at our diabetics? 
And the reason being is because they're nightmares. You know, we're, we're living with a, you know, we're living in a moo moo population where everybody's obese, and, you know, in the whole nine yards. And the reason that we're running, that they want to lower the guidelines for the diabetes is because now we're finding out that these guys all stroke out in the 40s and 50s. So this is why that, you know, if you look at the JNC guidelines, they you know, lowered it to 140. So it's, it's staying up to date, but understanding the reasoning behind it. See, I think this is where everybody goes wrong. People just want to know the facts, but the question is there's a story behind the fact. That's what I like to present, the story behind it. Why are we treating you know, the metabolic syndrome so much different than diabetes? Because I teach my students the metabolic syndrome, that's diabetes gone wild. I mean, these people are, these people are just nightmares. They are. They're just walking nightmares. So this is why we treat them so much more aggressively. So I try to teach the concept behind the fact, not just the fact. That's all. So if you keep it up to date, but teach the people why this new up-to-date standards there, then people, people can put their arms around it. That's back to the hunting, back to hunting mode. Back to the hunting, yep. Yeah. Okay, um, we have another NCAAP question that I don't know if earlier. Sure. Um, let me see here. It says, uh, please walk me through a sample vignette question and how you would attack and answer the question. I don't know what okay, that means. Uh, let me just show you what they... Okay, so hold on a second. We're going to take a take a quick look here. So can you see my screen now? No, nope. no. Nope. Maybe do you yeah. have a link that we can? Oh, there you go. Okay, it's popped up. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right, all right. So hopefully everybody's with me here, guys. All right, so all right, so 46 year old female woman wanders in the clinic, rambling incoherently. When questioned, she has some difficulty remembering what she asked. She exhibits some perceptual disturbances, not oriented to time. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? Okay, so there's a. What I always say to my students when you get these questions, it's like Cajun food. You got to choose slowly. Okay, so all right, so she's 46. This is a starter right here. You got it. She's 46. So she's not young. She's old, is it, all right? I mean, relatively old. I'm sorry if anybody else is old. <laughs> it's like saying, I'm I'm not going that door I apologize, guys. Didn't mean to throw you under the bus there. But she comes to the clinic and she's rambling incoherently. When questioned, she has some difficulty remembering what she was asked. She has perceptual disturbances. This is big. She's not oriented to time. So these are all pieces of information. So what happens is, is that, okay, so what the you know, the correct answer, what she's got. So can she be schizophrenic? No, she's too old. Paranoid? She's not. She's just rambling. Is she demented? No, she's walking, and but she's walking and talking. So it's going to be either a delirium or bipolar. Now, the issue to bipolar is that, okay, she, we could argue being manic. I mean, I could argue that. I mean, I could. Or, but usually with our bipolars, they are oriented to time. Does everybody see this one? That's the hallmark. So when you come down here, so what they're saying, the correct answer, oh, I got it right. So delirium, I didn't even see this. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. Apologize. So she's, she's, she's confused is what she does. So bipolar is incorrect because it doesn't exhibit the character of disorders. It's major, major, or mood thing. What they're really not telling you here, if you study bipolar, they are oriented at time. This person isn't. And then the other thing that's kind of given here is that they're saying that um, she's the option C. Dementia is not a plausible option because of her age. Remember, I said earlier this was a big. She was 46, so that's that's an issue as well. And then option D. She's paranoid personality is incorrect because she doesn't exhibit any signs of the disorder. Which she's not defensive. She's not suspicious or anything like that. She's not schizophrenic because she doesn't have any illusion. And the other thing with not telling you schizophrenia, guys. When does schizophrenia really? Much younger. They're in their 20s. They're teenagers. You know, 20s, 22s. That's when the schizophrenics really, you know, start blossoming. It's there. So right off the bat, this is huge. So this literally knocks out this, knocks out this, and so what we're left with is bipolar. Man, she's not that manic. So that's out. So now we're left with delirium versus paranoid, and she's not acting paranoid, is she? So that's how I would attack that question. So what I'm trying to share with you guys is that every piece of it, every piece of information is like food to chew. That's what I would do. Um, this one I got six days ago. I got a two-year-old boy as a temp of 40, so we can all agree he's pretty sick. Uh, cause 
fever has persisted. Now he's asked injected conjunctival strawberry tongue, dry fissures, desquamation of the hands, and bilateral cervical adenopathy. All right, guys, so we can all agree he's got Kawasaki's. And I would say with Kawasaki's, what's the wolf in your woods? It's a vasculitis. That's what you're worried about with this kid, is that he's got some type of vasculitis going on. So what part of the is the most vasculature thing of all? And it's going to be the coronary artery is what we're worried about. It's right here. So right off the bat, they're telling you he's got Kawasaki's. What they're really challenging you about, what is the biggest problem? Chorea? No. CHF? No. Mesenteric arteritis? No. Valvular heart disease? That would go with rheumatic heart disease or like somebody who had maybe strep throat. This is not strep throat, guys. This is Kawasaki's. And so this is why, you know, this is why he's got the Kawasaki syndrome because of this presentation. So the other ones are completely right out the bat. Um, so that's what it is. And they are, oh, see, they backed me up, beta hemolytic strep for rheumatic heart disease. So there you go. So that's what I do there. This one, 31-year-old female or African-American woman, worsening malaise. Okay. I always say, listen, guys, in the supposedly gender neutral, you know, ethnic neutral, everybody's neutral society, you start throwing things down like African American female. Why are you telling me that? I mean, I like African American people, but what are you giving me this for? I, I didn't care to know about that. But so in other words, they're giving you a what they're doing. So she's got red nodular. So what has she got, guys? This is probably gonna be sarcoidosis, is it not? And she's got the bilateral hyalur adenopathy. So she's, I mean, every single, everything here is screaming sarcoidosis. That's screaming it. Okay, malaise, low grade fever. Ha ha. See that word? There it is, guys. And guys, what is sarcoidosis? That's right, it's autoimmune. And how do you all your autoimmune diseases with steroids? And how are we going to treat this person? Steroids. Got it? So everything else is right off the bat wrong. So, so does everybody see, that's a hint. That's a huge hint. That's just like, I mean, they're literally throwing it at you. Does everybody see that? They're throwing it at you. And then the rod nodules in the legs, that's erythema nodosum, which is a vasculitis. Does everybody see where I'm going with this? So lymphoma, no. Meso, no. Tuberculosis, no. Organs granuloma, no. So does everybody see this? And there it is. For whoever was asked the question about um, who failed their boards, does everybody see this? There's the task. Get it? That's what I was talking about. That's that's the that is the horse. There's that's the car. That's what's killing people when they're they they know that they know the content. They just don't know how to apply it. Right. right exactly. But, that that's the horse, and there's the cart. Get it? Yeah. So there you go. Most likely form diagnosis. <clears throat> um, yeah. Okay. You guys want to go one more? We're good. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. What do you think, Wes? We, uh, you got, uh, you got anything else you want to present tonight before we close up? I think that backed up everything you were saying before. That kind of fell in the iritis thing. Kind yeah. Of fell oh yeah. In there, yeah right? I told I you. Mean, I told you. We're not. He's not just making this stuff up. Yeah. It just, <laughs> it just happens. It just happens, guys. So, so there you go. I hope that answers some questions, there, guys. I think great. that's perfect. All right. Well. Um, I really appreciate you, Joe, coming on and doing this. I know you've, you've been busy this week. You got uh, one more day left at Toro, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And, and uh, tell and us I, a little I'm, bit about your next class coming up. What's the next next thing? Yes, yeah, so the next class. Um, next class I got coming up, uh, guys, is going to be in March, and it's going to be in Irvine, California. It's going to be at the Hogue Hospital. There's a big auditorium that's very nice. It's probably the nicest place I can teach at, to be honest with you guys. It's very nice. And for those of you coming from out of town. There's actually a Candlewood Suites. It's literally in the back parking lot of the of the hospital. It's really nice. Basically, you just walk across the parking lot, and there you are. And I think uh, Marcus and I will be to that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With the surfboards on top of the yeah. car. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I think we should also mention, mention Marcus, is that this is all recorded, so whoever came in late, I saw some people jumping in late. Yeah, go yeah. Through there's, and there's a whole bunch of people popping in and out during this, this session, so that's... That's good. In fact, I'm glad we've had this attendance. I think that's uh, that's a great thing. I know it's been growing. We had we had about 10 or 15 people last week, and now you know we're up to about 20. Um, I think the max on here is 26. Am I am I incorrect or? Yeah, we can always. I guess we can eventually bump that up. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And again, we appreciate your questions. Um, you know, we'll try to have Joe on occasionally. Uh, 
I know, again, Joe, appreciate you being on, being so busy this week and everything. And so no worries. I'm good. No good, worries. Good, good to go down that path. And, uh, and we thank everybody that signed up for the course. And uh, we really appreciate if you could go over and uh, like us on Facebook. We, we're constantly posting little knickknacks there. And again, this video is going to be on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that and get um, – updates and things that we're going to be doing. We're going to be posting videos on a regular basis with news news and information that's going on. So uh, make sure you subscribe there as well. So check us out. Uh, on P uh, Go ahead, Wes. You want to mention the blog maybe? Yeah. In fact, the yeah. blog's done. I just don't have anything on it. Uh, I'm going to start posting stuff tonight. Um, so if people have questions, go ahead and, you know, go to our contact us page. You can fill out stuff there. I'm more than happy to add that on there with Joe's comments uh, when he gets a chance to answer them. And then um, uh, we'll have, we'll have uh, information about things that are coming up, events and things like that as well. So uh, it'll be the blog post will be set right here at the top of this menu and we'll have that on. So, all right, guys, I think that kind of wraps it up. Um, Stay on afterwards. Anybody wants to stick around, we'll call it good.